for grace. And if by grace, then there's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You know, Romans 10, we just done it. Romans 10, 4 says, Christ is the end of the law to righteousness for everyone that believeth. And no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. Colossians 2 says that Jesus took the handwritings and the ordinances that was against us and they nailed them to his cross. The law was done with folks. Jesus fulfilled it in every jot and every tittle. He completely fulfilled it. He didn't come destroy it. He come to fulfill it and he did. Now we're under grace. We're not under law. Thank God. Grace says do and live. But you know, the law says do and live. But what does grace say? It's done. Amen. Law never saved anyone. All it does is condemn. But the grace of God, it forgives. And grace empowers us to live the Christian life. Titus 2.11, the great spirit of God, the grace of God appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodly and worldly lusts and to live soberly and righteous in this present world and to look for that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? So we got a teacher now. We got the Holy Spirit and live inside of us, but you had a free will to choose Christ. Now you got a free will. To, what are you going to follow? You going to follow the Holy Spirit and walk in line with Christ or are you going to follow your own nature? And it's a choice we have every minute of every day. Amen? You know, God saves the inner part of us. He puts within us a divine nature as a Holy Spirit. And that's the new man the Bible calls. But we still have the old man or old woman, whatever y'all want to call her. You know, we still got that old nature and it's going to be with us until we die and go and be with the Lord or until that trumpet sounds and calls us get up and get out here recognize that and notice that because Paul said in my flesh I find nothing not one thing is good not one thing and if Paul couldn't find anything in his flesh good we can't find none in ours either amen so recognize that old thing I was telling one of the fellows in Sunday school this morning I think that flesh tagging along with him he don't recognize it and realize it and he's beating himself up about this thing I told him look even though it wants you to do it you don't have to follow it you can crucify that booger through the power of Jesus Christ and you can walk in the Spirit. And he's going to come, the devil's going to come, and the world's going to come. We've got a three-way battle. But guess what? Jesus is bearing all the rim. He's much bigger. He is almighty and he's living in it. He just wants you to just get in the yoke with him and just walk right along with him. And hey, we tried it the other way. You know, this Christian experience is a growing thing. And we can keep growing until the end. We'll never get there we can keep on maturing and keep on maturing until we see Jesus. We're never going to reach it, but hey, he wants you to just keep on and keep on growing closer and closer and walking closer and closer and look more like him because when you look more like Jesus and you tell people about Jesus, it's going to have an effect on them. Amen? Amen. That's what he wants. He's got us and he's got us taken care of and whatever you do after you've been born again, he's got you. You're going to heaven. Now, Connie, you are Nellie's daughter. Because she gave birth to you, right? And there's never going to be a day that Connie's not her child. Amen? No matter what Connie does, still will be Nellie's, right? All right. Well, what salvation is, it's a birth too. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. No way you can go to heaven without being born again. And that new birth is, see, as many as received him... To them, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Even those that believe on his name, actually salvation is a birth. And when you're born again, you become God's child. And do you think you can never be God, once you're God's child, that you can lose that relationship? It is not possible. If the natural, Connie's always going to be Nellie's, then we're always going to be God. Amen. Because he done it. He said it's finished. And the only thing that counts is believing and receiving him for your salvation because he's done it all. It's wonderful, isn't it? People, people say, well, I just got to do something. Yeah, the only thing you got to do is hear the word and believe it and receive Jesus Christ. That's your part and all your, that's the only part we have is believing and receiving and trusting because he's done it all. If we had a part in it, we surely messed it up. We would have, because that's all man. Anything he touches, he messes it up, don't he? He does. But we got a perfect salvation that was perfected before the foundation of the world. God Almighty left heaven, 
took a body and died on a cruel cross. They buried him and he rose again. That's the gospel according to scriptures. And that's the message that saves lives. Amen. Amen. Paul said, Paul was a genius. And you know what he said? I come to you knowing just one thing. And that's Christ crucified, buried, and risen again. It goes on in verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And again, that's the Jews that believe. And once you believe, you become a body, part of the body of Christ. So that's election. But the other one were uh, still in unbelief. And then we catch it back in Romans chapter 10. Just turn back a page in verse 3, and we'll read this again. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And see, the reason they haven't found it, they haven't trusted in the Messiah, the Christ, and they're trying to keep the law to make, make their own righteousness, which will never happen. Because you know what Isaiah says? Even the best that we can do in ourselves, all we can come up with is filthy rags. That's the best. When you look at Jesus and you look at us, he is so pure and he is so holy and he is so righteous. That's all we can look like is filthy rags. But thank God when you believe and trust in him, his righteousness is imputed to us, folks. And when God the Father looks down upon us, he no longer sees us in our weak and feeble stage. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ and we're perfect in his sight. Great day. Amen. Mm. And that's the righteousness that we want. We want the righteousness that is imputed by faith. Verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. You know, if you introduce the light and reject the light, then it gets dark. The more you reject the light, the darker it gets. So actually, just like Pharaoh, God really didn't harden his heart. God told him something to do, and he resisted doing it, and that made his heart hard. And God kept on giving him something, and he kept refusing, and he got harder and harder. Same thing with Israel. The Messiah was here. Jesus was here. Blind people, he gave them sight. People couldn't walk. He said, get up and walk. He raised the dead. Lazarus did four days, and he just said words. He, understood. he knew what people were thinking, and he would tell them what they were thinking. He was God. They had all this light around them, and yet they rejected it. And that's why they're blinded. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. And start in verse 13. Therefore, Jesus is speaking, as he read, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah's, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and you shall not understand. And by seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Thus at any time they shall see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, he's talking about the disciples, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. But listen to what he says in verse 17. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Look, the Son of God, God in very flesh, was speaking. Many prophets and righteous men wanted to hear it, but they never got to hear it, did they? They never heard it. They never seen Jesus. And here he is performing all the miracles that he done. And still, they refused to believe that he was the Christ. Verse 9. And David saith, Let their table be a made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. So what David's saying here, it's in Psalm 69 and verses 22. But what David's saying, again, what they're doing, they're trying to make their own righteousness. They're trying to do it by the works of the law. And it just, it bum a snare to them because they had the Son of God, very God in flesh, right there before their eyes and they refused to believe and receive him. 
That's so sad, isn't it? So sad. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Hey, folks, in the Old Testament, guess what we were? We were considered as the Gentile dogs. We were out of the commonwealth of God. We were aliens, and we were without hope. But when Christ came, laid his life down on that cross, and rose again, he broke down all the walls, and he opens up the door for anyone and everyone. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, here we were, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, but what? But, always got that but. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood, by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who have made both one, Jew and Gentile alike, those that will believe, and have broken down the middle wall, a partition between us. You know, when he died, there was an earthquake, and the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. And that veil kept from anybody from going into the Holy of Holies except for the high priest who could only go once a year. And he could only go once a year. And he had to have blood for his sins and the people's sins. No one else could go. But now, since Christ has shed his precious blood, it's offered the Holy of Holies to the Father. Go right straight to it through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hey, you know, we was talking about Peter. And what happened to Peter, how he backslid, the first thing Jesus told him, Satan has desired you, Peter, and he wants to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith fail you not. Jesus warned Peter. So he told him, he said, y'all go pray. No, first Peter said, hey, if any, all of them deny you, I won't deny you. I'll die for you. So what Peter does, he boasts. So first thing, God, Jesus warns him. Then he boasts. And then Jesus said, pray for me. Well, what did he do? He fell asleep. All right, so that's teaching us, don't, don't boast and always be in prayer. Hey, when you feel like you're getting a little weak and your journey's getting a little rough, you need to pray. The flesh is coming on, you need to pray. Because the only way you're going to get through that thing is to pray and ask for God's help and He's going to give it to you and you're going to be all right. Next thing He does, all right, He boasts. Then He don't pray. Then he starts following Jesus afar off. Don't do it, folks. You get busy during your busy day, and sometimes you fall away and just, you, you don't think about Jesus like you should, don't you? But you've got to keep going back, because we need him so much. So there he is. He follows him afar off. Fourth thing he does, he warms himself by the devil's fire. You know, you start, he was freezing to death in the spirit, although he's getting warm on the outside. Look, so he's telling us, we warn if the devil wants to sift Peter, don't you think he wants to sift us? Sure he does. He's the one that's going to come try to make you doubt your salvation. He's going to come and tempt you. He's going to do all kinds of things. He's going to play with your mind. Because that's where the battle is. Amen? Battle's up here. But hey, keep, your, keep, keep fixed on cross. In Christ, pray. You've got to pray, folks. We've got to pray for ourselves. We've got to pray for each other. And just pray, pray, pray. you got to. you got to. Hey, and don't follow him afar off. Just get in the yoke with him, walk with him. That's what he wants to do. And it's offered to all believers. Come with me. Come on. Come on. Nathaniel said, huh? Come and see. He said, told Nathaniel, come and see. And when he came to see, he seen what Jesus could do. And that's all I can tell y'all. Come and see. If you don't believe what I'm saying, try it. And you'll see that it'll work. The Bible says it works. It's got to work. Amen? Amen? It works. And then don't mess with the devil's crowd. You get out there, we out there to witness them, love on them and witness them, but don't participate in the things they do. Amen? So that's just a short little thing. I don't know it went in with this, but we was there, so we said it. Back to Romans 11. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? 
It's a time coming. They're in unbelief now, but there's a time coming that they're going to believe as a nation. Right now, individual Jews are being saved. They're being born again. If they trust in Jesus, they can be born again and become the body of Christ just like you and I. But to now, we're all saved alike, exactly, by grace through faith. And here's something, too. We're all saved alike. None of us deserve it. So we're all saved in the same way, and we're all saved just the same amount. Nobody's any more saved than anybody else, folks. We're all saved just alike. Your sins are underneath the blood just as well as mine is. Every believer's are underneath the precious blood of Jesus Christ. All them filthy pages that we had in our past have been wiped clean by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That, that deserves an amen to hallelujah, Greg, in the morning. So he goes on, and he says in verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now here we are, aliens and all this other things, and the Jews not too likable to us, were they? They wouldn't. The Samaritans, they hated them. They didn't even want to see them during the day. They prayed that God wouldn't even let them see one during the day. But look at Paul. Here Paul is. He knows what it is to try to have his own righteousness because he was a Pharisee. He said by law he was blameless. But when he met Jesus, he seen how worthless and worthwhile all that was. When he seen Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was changed, and now he's preaching a different thing. The only way you can be as righteous is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he knew it. He had been both sides of the fence, see, and he knew, and he wanted to preach. He wasn't ashamed to preach to the Gentiles. He was happy and really, really excited about the thing, and he did, and he preached to them. If by any means I may provoke them to emulation, them which are my flesh, and might save some. Well, here's Paul. They knew how Paul was. Now Paul is preaching Jesus, and he's preaching that he's the Son of God, very God in flesh, and he's the only way to salvation. And they're seeing this, so he's hoping by him doing that and the Gentiles being saved, they're going to get a little jealous, and they're going to want part of it, so they'll be saved also, see. He's, uh, he's wanting to save he wanted his boys to get saved. He had a passion. He said in Romans 9 that he wished himself could be accursed, that he could even lose his salvation just for the sake of his brethren in the flesh, the Jewish people. Now, that's a hard, isn't it? Anybody that's willing to give up their own salvation for somebody else to be saved, that's a heart in tune with Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the Bible says, you know, for a righteous man, some may die, but for, for somebody that you don't like, you die for them. That's almost impossible. But what did Jesus do? He died for his enemies, didn't he? He died for his enemies. And Paul wanted to know Christ, and he knew Christ. And you could tell by just the things that he said. When somebody's got that much compassion about other souls, he's knowing Jesus, and he's knowing him in a serious, serious way. That's what we can pray. Lord, help my heart. Help me care more for those lost people. That's what we do. I'm telling you, this church here is, is, is on the move. We're hearing it. People are being saved. God is using this, this small little church right now, and we hope that it's going to grow. I hope Clearview, Clearview just fills up this whole house, and these people are taught, and they really hold on to that Word of God and take it to heart and get out there and witness to people. People's getting saved, folks, by the things that you say and the things you're doing because you're using God's Word. I can see it because I've heard some of y'all telling me some things, and the last Sunday night proved it for a fact that it is going on. And he's still stretching out that arm and he's wanting to save them, wants to pull them out. Hey, time is getting close. Everything that needs to happen has already happened in prophecy before the trumpet sounds and Jesus calls us up out of here. It could happen any day. So it's time to get busy. Tell them a kind, help them, do a kind, anything kind that you can do, anything that you can do that makes it look like Christ is in you, just do it and do it and pray for you do it and ask God anytime you're going to do anything this Christian like is pray before you do it say Jesus help me do this because we don't know how to do it but he does amen and if you ask him and he's in it things have got to happen got to happen don't they amen verse 15 for if casting the way of them be the reconciling of the world what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Right now, see, you and I were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were children of the devil. 
we were spiritually dead. But you have he quickened. He made us alive. And he born us and he saved us. And now we're no longer dead. But we're alive. We're spiritually alive. But Israel, they're in unbelief, right? So they are spiritually dead right now. Even though they're alive, they're spiritually dead. And he says they're dead. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37. And we're going to go to the bones. Now start in verse 4. Ezekiel 37, 4. Again he said unto me, Prophesize upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. You know what he did to Adam? He made him out of dust of the earth, didn't he? And then he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Amen? You know, when we were spiritually dead, actually, He breathed in us the Holy Spirit and made us alive. He did it to the disciples, didn't He? He breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Amen? But now, the Jews, they're, they're dead in their trespasses of sin because they're in unbelief. Read on, verse 6. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh came up upon me, upon them. And the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. And then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man. And say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet as an exceeding great army. Now here's the verse. He's going to tell you what these dry bones are. The Bible always tells you what it's talking about. Scripture explains Scripture, and it's the best way to go. You can try to explain it, but it don't matter what you think. It matters what the Bible says. And the Word of God is true. And if you're speaking the Word of God, you can count on it, and you know it's true, and you can proclaim it with all authority and all soundness and just let it do what it's got to do. Here's what these bones are. Look, verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. That settles it, don't it? That's who he's talking about. They are spiritually dead and they're in unbelief, but guess what? After the rapture, after the tribulation period, when he comes into Revelation, they're going to see him, and they going to them bones are going to come back to life, and they're going to receive him as their Savior. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesize and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and my people and brought you up out of your graves. They're spiritually dead and they're in graves today. Think about it. Although they're alive, they're dead. They're spiritually dead. But he's going to take them up one day. And I believe it's coming soon. Nobody knows the day of the hour, but look around you folks. As the days of Noah were, Amen. so will the days when the Son of Man comes. When the days of Lot were, so will the days when the Son of Man comes. All of it's done. He'll come at the exactly right time, and you'll be ready because you're covered with the blood. That's the only way you can be ready, and you'll never be any more ready when you believe and trust in Him. So we're going up. We're going out of here. We get a glorified body like Christ, and uh, sounds pretty good to me. Sound real good to me because we're getting a little older and we're getting a little frailer and these bodies are hurting a little more and we're hearing less and we're seeing less. But praise God, when we see him, we're going to get a glorified body like him. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm back to Romans. Verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, and that's the Jews that are believing and being born again today. If they be holy, and the only way any of us is holy is through Christ. He is our holiness, He's our redemption, and He is our righteousness. Holiness, we have none. 
of our own, but He is our holiness. He is our righteousness. He's our everything. He is full sufficient for us in every natural need, every spiritual need, every need you have is completed in Jesus Christ. The lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And I believe the root here would be Abraham, because he is the father of faith. Now, we as believers, spiritual children of Abraham, I'm not a Jew. Anybody in here a Jew? And I'll never be a Jew. The church ain't replaced Israel. Never will. Israel is still Israel, and the church is a different thing. Because in Corinthians tells us, I think it's in 1030, it says, take none offense to the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. Three people on this earth. That's a Jew. God the Father's elect. He chose them out of all the people in the whole world. They were just the small people, but he chose them. They're his leg. Can't nothing be changed about that. He done it. All right? And then there's the Gentile. That's the lost people in the world today. And then there's the church of God. And that's to everyone that's been born again and are washed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And if some of these branches be broken off, which they are because of unbelief, they're broken off, but watch. And thou, being a wild, wild olive tree, here we are, we the wild, we were the ones out of the commonwealth. We were aliens, and we were the wild olive tree. You know what? You can draft the good tree onto the good tree, but you're not supposed to be able to, by nature, graft the old wild tree to it. It won't, it won't work. But with God, nothing's impossible, right? He can graft the old wild thing right on in there. Amen? And he, he can, and he does. Because nothing is impossible for him. The only thing impossible for God is to lie. The Bible says it's impossible for him to lie. So everything I'm reading you tonight is God's word and his truth. Nothing but the truth. That's, that's God's word. He can't lie. Hey, he said he saved you when you call on him. Believe him, trust him. You know, when a person tells you something and you think they're honest, you believe them, don't you? Why shouldn't you believe this that much more? This is coming from the heart of God, the mind of God, and whatever he says is truth, and you can bank on it, you can count on it, you can live on it, and you can die about it, and you're going to end up in heaven. Amen? Amen. And with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. That will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Isn't that wonderful? You know, the Jew was blinded in part for our sakes. We'll see that in verse 25. For if God, listen, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. And as we were saying, you know, when we believe on Jesus Christ, we get everlasting life. When you believe on Jesus Christ, everlasting. How long is everlasting? If you become a child, you're always going to be his child. So he's not talking to individuals here. He's talking to people as a whole. If they don't believe, you cannot possibly lose your salvation. You know, 1 Peter 1.5 says we are kept by the power of God. We're kept. We're preserved. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You can't touch that. You can't touch what God is. The devil can't touch you. He can't change that fact, and he knows it. And what he's working so hard to do is try to get you to stumble and fall and ruin your witness in this world. That's all he can do. He can't, he can't have no power over you if you're leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ because Jesus is much more mightier than him, but he's going to try to trip you, try to beat you in a snare, and try to ruin your testimony. And that's why it's so important for us to walk upright because people are watching they're watching. If you live a half-hearted life for Christ and the world sees you, you know what they're going to say when you try to tell them about Jesus? Here's what they're going to say. I've heard them. Well, I live better than they do. What in the world? I ain't no use of me having none of that. But if you're walking in the Spirit and they see Jesus in you and you tell them about Jesus, say, hmm, I, I believe you got something real. And then you'll draw them. Yes, indeed. So it's important. But that has nothing 
to do with our salvation. It goes back to pure grace. You know, you can't say you got to do this, you got to do that to be saved because Jesus said it's finished. It's done. Just rest in Him and trust in Him. That's how you overcome. We overcome by faith. And that's trusting in somebody that's so much bigger than us and so much bigger than the devil and so much bigger than the flesh and the world. He is gigantic. He spoke a world in existence and He's living in you as a person of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. It's, a, it's almost too much for our little minds to take in, isn't it? Because God, He's just so wonderful and so powerful and so awesome and so all-knowing. He's just God and Jesus is God. He's right up there with the Father. He is equal with the Father, but there is definitely three distinct persons in the Godhead. Jesus is praying to Him. Revelation 5, we see Jesus come and take the book out of God the Father's hand. And Daniel, we see the God the Father, the Ancient of Days, and we see the Son of Man coming to Him. So there are definitely, we see at the baptism of Jesus, we see God the Son into water, being baptized because He came to fulfill every righteous act. Baptism, water baptism has nothing to do with salvation, but it is a righteous act. Anybody that's been born again ought to get in the water and get baptized because it's just being obedient to what God tells us to do. But we see Him in the water. Everybody confessed their sins when they got there and was baptized. But guess what? Jesus didn't have any to confess, did He? He didn't have one. Never, never, never sinned. We see God the Holy Spirit descended upon Him and we hear God the Father speak out of heaven. Amen. There they are. There they are. Amen. Verse 22. This is, this is one verse is just packed. Listen to it now. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity. There you have the goodness and severity in one sentence. The goodness. Goodness on those that believe and receive, but severity on those that refuse to believe and receive. Look at the severity during the Old Testament. Guess how many people got saved out of the flood? Eight sold. The whole world perished, but eight sold. I'd say that's pretty severe, wouldn't you? But guess what? Noah was preaching for 120 years. 120 years. Every time he put a plank on that boat, he's preaching, judgment's coming. It's coming. Judgment's coming for 120 years. Guess how many believed him? None. We preach it today. Judgment's coming. It's coming, folks. You know, we're under grace, and he's holding his judgment back right now. But when that day of grace is ended, the dispensation of grace, the church age, when the church is raptured out, judgment's coming, folks. It's coming. You can read it all the way through Revelation from chapters, chapters 5, 1 through 19. It's going to happen. Nothing can stop it. It's written down and it's coming. And the world needs to hear it. And maybe they would grasp a hold of Jesus Christ and come on to him. He's love. He's merciful. He's kind. He's gentle. But he's a consuming fire. And he's angry with the wicked every day. And he cannot acquit the wicked. The only way they can be acquitted is by the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's awful to everyone. But if they refuse, they'll be just like Israel. What happened to them? They were